This is, let's see, it is Easter Sunday at Mitchellville Christian Church, and uh, we are all spread out today. So we're all spread out. This is a new thing. Some of us did this last week and others have not. Uh, so we're still working out bugs and um, enjoying enjoying the new uh, new way of doing worship together. So a couple of things about the, um, if you haven't been here this way already, uh, you might see that this is a recorded service. We will be recording it, um, but as to my knowledge, the only thing that we'll be showing is the person speaking um, and the slides that are um, that are presented. So, um, welcome everyone, and I'll ask Scott now to uh, give our announcements. I'll admit I was looking frantically through my phone and I can't find my bulletin, so I don't know if there is any birthdays or anniversaries that we need to speak about. Nothing? All right, so then we're kind of lacking on announcements, I guess, but it's Easter Sunday, so that's awesome, even though we're far apart, but not really because most of us are in the same town. We're still together here, and whether or not we met in the church building this morning or not doesn't change the fact that today the tomb is empty and it's resurrection day. So I would guess we would just start right along with our call to worship. And just before we move on, I want to say thank you to Jeff uh, for taking over that, uh, that part of this and then also to Casey for running the slides and uh, everything else. This is a new uh, territory and we're figuring out and it, it works a lot better when we're working together. So thank you guys. And for Penny, also for playing music because that, um, that is certainly something we miss about being in our sanctuary together. So thank you all. So will you all join me in the call to worship? Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord, the Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with joy. And we will start by singing the first hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. <laughs>
join me in prayer? Lord, we just come to you this morning with grateful hearts. We thank you for the gift that is your son. Lord, we celebrate this morning as we come from Friday clear to Sunday, Lord. We celebrate the fact that the tomb is empty and he is risen again indeed. Lord, we just thank you for that gift. We thank you for the promise that that gift brings us. And Lord, as we still feel like we're in Saturday in our current moment in life, we know that Sunday's on the horizon. Today, we celebrate that day. Please hear us as we say the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is youth time, and I, uh, not seeing any youth, I am still going to go ahead and do this. And Casey, I'm going to take over the screen for just a minute to do this here. Um, I have something I would like to share, and that way any, um, let's see, any children who watch this later uh, will be able to, to see this here. So I have a story um, that has been really meaningful to me. It's a really good um, retelling of the Easter story. And I'm going to read it from the book here. And the pictures and the words are on the screen. You should, can everyone see that okay? I think I see heads nodding. Yes, okay, thumbs up. Good deal. All right. So this is called, This is the Mystery of Easter. It's by Amelia Richardson Dress. And it's read with permission by the author. There once was a man who loved big enough to change the world. People knew he was in God and God was in him. Everywhere he went, people would ask him, what's the best way to live? And this man whose name was Jesus would answer, love, love God, love yourself, love everyone else. Now there were some people who didn't like what Jesus was teaching. They did not want to be told to love God, love themselves and love everyone else. It's a very hard thing to love that big. Instead of learning this very hard thing, they decided to have Jesus killed. This is the hard part of the story. When we tell this part of the story, we always say, this is not the end of the story. The hard part of the story is that Jesus's enemies did not want to learn to love, so they had Jesus killed on a cross. The cross reminds us of a very sad thing. Jesus's friends, the ones who knew that he was in God and God was in him, were very sad. They remembered how they felt when Jesus was around, like God was with them too. Their hearts were broken. Jesus' friends put him in a tomb, which was like a cave, and they used a big stone for the door. Then they took some time to cry and hug and try to fix their broken hearts. Later, several of Jesus' friends went to the tomb where he was buried. Sometimes, when you're very sad because someone has died, it helps to visit their grave. The tomb was like a grave, and Jesus' friends were very sad. When they got there, they discovered that the huge, huge stone that had been blocking the entrance was out of the way. Thank you. 
Inside, they saw a man dressed in a white robe who said to them, do not be afraid. You're sad, but here is good news. Jesus is alive again. This is a mysterious story. This is the story that changes the cross. It still reminds us of a sad thing, but now it also reminds us of a good, important thing. Now it reminds us that no matter what happens, no matter how hard things are, we are with God and God is with us. This is the secret to loving God, loving yourself, and loving everyone else. God is always with you. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your son. Thank you for the cross and for the empty tomb that we remember today. Thank you for this way that we are able to come together and remember and to worship you. In your son's name we pray, amen. Our scripture reading for today is found in John chapter 20, 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the other linen wrappings, wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing for him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbi which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said, said these things to her. And our next hymn will be In the Garden, page 227.
Our sermon this morning will um, be brought to us by the General Minister and President of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. Her name is Reverend Terry Horde Owens, and I'm excited to share her words with you this morning uh, because I think they are exactly the thing that we as Mitchellville Christian Church need to hear and we as Christians in the world experiencing this new reality need to hear right now. And uh, so with that, uh, let us listen to the words of Reverend, o Reverend Owens. Um, and Casey has that video. Thank you. Good morning, church. Happy Resurrection Sunday. This is your General Minister and President, Terry Hort Owens, and I am so excited to be gathered with you across our entire church in the U.S. and Canada to worship together on Easter morning. We had great expectations for Easter, as we always do. We planned and executed part of our Lenten studies. We were preparing for special music, special sermons, our children were going to give their wonderful Easter speeches. We would have dramas. We would invite friends and family to worship with us on Easter Sunday. And at my house, the entire Owens family gathers each year for Easter dinner. And I'm the cook. I am normally cooking on Easter weekend in addition to everything else. But none of this happened the way we had expected. Our society is in the midst of a disruption, the likes of which we have never seen in our entire lives. And we have been clinging and holding on to familiar and things and traditions that give us comfort. Even as we're forced to try new ways and learn new things about how we can bring worship to the masses when we cannot physically gather. We've been reaching out because we cannot physically comfort those who are sick and grieving. We have not been able to gather for celebrations. And yet we've been holding on to the familiar, hoping that surely when this is all over, things will go back to the way they have been. But church, we are in a new world and it is unlikely that things will ever be the same again. And that, I argue, is a good thing. Our good friend Walter Brueggemann in his book, The Prophetic Imagination, talks about the importance of the ministry of imagination. It's important to imagine first and then implement, he says, because anything can be implemented. We must prepare ourselves, church, for that ministry of imagination, not only for being relevant in the new world, but as a church to help shape that new world. Grounding ourselves in the spirit, feeding ourselves on scripture, giving ourselves the courage to imagine, the courage to do, the courage to change, the courage to live beyond the disruptions in new ways, the courage to help shape a new world permission to change, permission to let things go, and freedom from fear of what will happen when we do change. It's not an option anymore. This is the world we are in. That first Easter was filled with disruptions of all sorts. On Friday, those women and the disciple John stood at the foot of the cross witnessing one of the most horrific deaths known to humankind. Jesus died beaten, battered, and bloodied on a cross. And when he was laid in a tomb, those days between Friday and Sunday must have been the most devastating of their lives. His followers all around the countryside, traumatized, afraid, and in exile. Mary and the women were clinging to those familiar rituals and traditions as they went to the tomb early that Sunday morning, hoping to anoint the Lord's body. They hadn't been able to do it on their Sabbath, so they went intent on being sure that what they knew was right was done. And as they arrive at the tomb, another disruption. The stone is rolled away, the tomb is empty, and Jesus' body is not there. 
they run to get Peter and the other disciple who come to take a look and one disciple looks in but doesn't go in but believes Peter goes in and they leave going back to their homes Mary is left there in the garden weeping and at a certain point she gets up to go inside the tomb and sees two angels one sitting at the head and the other at the foot in the place where Jesus had laid. They ask her, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And she says, I do not know what they have done to my Lord. And if you know where they've taken his body, please tell me so that I can go and retrieve it. As she turns around, she sees someone she thinks is the gardener. And he asks her, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And she says, sir, if you know where my Lord is, please tell me where I can find him. He calls her name, and it is then that she knows that it is Jesus, Mary. He assures her that he is fine, he will ascend to the Creator, but that she is to go and tell the disciples that he is alive and will soon meet them in Galilee. Another disruption. Mary, a woman, is given the awesome responsibility of sharing the gospel news that Jesus has risen for the very first time in all of history. Mary runs to tell the disciples, and I'm sure they all imagined that things would simply go back to the way they were. Jesus was alive. He will have dinner at Mary and Martha's house in Bethany. He will eat with us. He will talk with us. People will come and they will listen to his teachings and he will kill them. It will all be like it was before. But they did not yet understand the meaning of the resurrection. They didn't yet understand what Jesus meant by this kingdom of God that he had been talking about. Before he ascends, he reminds them that he will send to them the Holy Spirit who will teach them and remind them about what he has taught. He charges them to go and tell the story of his death and resurrection, baptizing those in the name of his Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that they have taught, they have been taught by him. Church, if ever there is a time when we must claim this prophetic imagination and claim the courage to change, it is now. In the midst of disruption, the church of Jesus Christ was born in the midst of disruption. People not understanding what would come of Jesus' death, not understanding the new normal, the new world that they would inhabit once he had ascended into heaven. That first church gathered in their homes. They did radical things like put all their resources together to ensure that everyone had enough. They kept the tradition of the Lord's Supper, which we continue till this day, remembering Jesus' death and resurrection until he comes again. They told stories, shared testimonies. They were living new lives, trying to create a new world. And 2,000 years later, we are carrying their traditions with us, but we have our own disruption to which we must respond. Church, we must be ready to not only imagine a new world, but to help shape the new world that is surely coming. And I want to remind you that there will be church after this. There will be hope and glory and love after this disruption. There will be peace and joy after this disruption and even in the midst because of Christ. I hope that you will continue to feed your spirits on the Word of God, to listen to the teaching of the Holy Spirit, to gather as we can gather and feed and support one another. But I pray that your prophetic imagination takes flight and that we are all able to have the courage to imagine this new world that is already here and how we will be church in it and how we will help to shape the world so that it will become that kingdom of God where all are welcome and all have enough. This is my prayer, my hope. This 
is the imagination to which God calls us. Get ready, church. God love you, and so do I. Reverend Owens asks at the end of that sermon, are you ready to imagine? And what are you ready to imagine? And this vision that she talks about of the kingdom of God and how we are invited to use our prophetic imagination to not only think about what that will look like and what, how we can be church after all of this is over, but also how can we shape the, the world that is coming after this because nothing is going to be the same. And so that is the message that I want all of us to, to allow ourselves to imagine about and to open our eyes and to open our imaginations right here and now and for the future that is coming. And with that in mind, let us sing together our next hymn, which is a great Easter hymn. It is He Lives, and the words will be on the screen. Let us go, go now to God in prayer. And this is a responsive prayer, as Jeff said. So when I say Christ is risen, I want you all to respond, Christ is risen indeed. And because this is Easter, because this is a day of celebration, I want you to say it loud. And if you don't want your picture to show up, do as Jeff said and, and turn your camera off or don't because we all like seeing your faces. <laughs> Alleluia. What was dead shall live, what was dark shall shine, what was forgotten shall be remembered, 
for the Lord is risen and walks among us. Let us confidently bring before God the needs of all our world, asking God for renewal and responding, Christ is risen indeed. <clears throat> Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. God of life, in gratitude and great joy, we laud you for the gifts of Christ's resurrection. On this day, give us hope for Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. On this feast day, which brings joy to all Christian believers, may we commit ourselves to work toward the unity of the church, that Christ's body may not be one, or may not be one, for Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Honoring the gift of Christ's risen body, may we rise to serve all those whose needs keep them from seeing themselves as the image of God, for Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. indeed. For all who have need of the gift of Easter, for all who journey from illness to health, from despair to hope, from grief to consolation, from loneliness to love. For our healthcare workers and our truck drivers, and our grocery store employees, for our farmers and our postal workers and our teachers, for our parents and our grandparents, for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, for an end to this virus, an end to all suffering, and an end to all loneliness, for the courage to imagine, the courage to shape our world, and the courage to love as we have been loved, for all of those that we name in our hearts, for all our brothers, sisters, and siblings, that death may have no more power over us, for Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. For all who suffer and all who mourn, that today the Lord God will wipe away all tears, for Christ is risen. Christ, Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. May we have the persistent faith of Mary Magdalene and the surprised belief of Peter and John. May we long to be God's sign of life in our world, for Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. May we be one in faith with all who have died in Christ, for our life is hid with Christ in God, for Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. God of life, we thank you for the mystery planted in us, the paradox of life from death and community from scattered disciples. We praise you for the dying which saves us from death and for rising which brings us life. We pray as we live through Jesus, the risen one, in the, name, in the power of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 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 If you have with you those elements that you gathered at the beginning, um, a little bread and water, I have a cinnamon roll and some coffee, because that is what we made for breakfast today. This is the table that we come to. These tables are symbolic of the table that we come to every week as disciples. And every week we remember this Sunday, because the table reminds us of that meal that happened on Monday Thursday, where Jesus gathered in the room with his disciples, and he gathered, and he broke bread, and he shared with them a common cup, knowing what was to come. And he shared with those who would betray him, and those who would deny him, those who felt that they would be loyal to the end, and those whose faith failed them when it seemed to matter most. Jesus gathered at the table knowing all of this, and it is here that we remember that everyone is welcome. We remember that Last Supper because it points us to the cross. And we remember that Christ's sacrifice 
on the cross his, and his life and the end of his life and his death and his resurrection is for each and every one of us. For those of us who agree and those who don't, for those who look like us and those who don't, for those who pray like us and those who don't. Christ's love, Christ's death, Christ's resurrection is for all. And all are welcome to the table. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the weather outside today is, is just gloomy and nasty and it must mirror the, the ideas and the reflections of the disciples since Friday night when Jesus was betrayed and hung on the cross and I'm sure their hearts are heavy as the clouds are outside today. And even though they followed Jesus and he taught them, somehow they didn't really understand that this was to fulfill the promise that God made long ago that Jesus would triumph over death on Easter morning and be resurrected and be the only person who had ever cheated death until that point. So that if we would just believe upon him, we would be forever given the great gift that God gave us of everlasting life. If we would just believe upon his son Jesus and the resurrection and all that Easter brings. Lord, we don't have the graveside or a tomb to come look and remember you. We have this table. <clears throat> we come to this table every week and we take these elements that you gave us that represent your body and your blood, Lord, and we take these to remember you and remember the gift you were to us. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of your son, the promise of eternal life we have through that. And Lord, even though today is gloomy, we know the sun will come out because the tomb is empty. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was up in the upper room when Jesus, Jesus took bread and broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take it, eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, he poured it out. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often you do this, do it in remembrance of me.
video and um, the and the video of the sermon this morning were provided by disciples from all over the US and Canada we had our general minister and president Terry Hord Owens and then um, the video that was just shared representing or showing all the ways that disciples are changing their traditions, but still maintaining some of them in this new time that we're all in together. And one of the things that our church supports, our Easter offering, will typically go to the Disciples Mission Fund, which goes to the general ministries of the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, in the U.S. and in Canada. And the different ministries that they support um, allow for these kinds of collaborations to happen. And they also go to things like Week of Compassion that help during times of disaster uh, to provide relief in different areas. Support also goes to local congregations uh, and to the different ministries that come out of those local congregations. So as you are uh, thinking about giving this morning. Um, you, there are a couple of ways to do that. We have our, uh, you can give online by going to mitchellvillechristianchurch.org slash give. You can uh, download the mobile app, which is Gib Givelify, and find Mitchellville Christian Church. If you would like to give to Disciples Mission, fu Mission Fund, uh, you can do that there should be a designation on the app or if you give online for that fund. Um, as well, if you are sending in a check, you can write that in the memo and that will get to them. And during this time that we can't all be together, I just want to encourage you to, uh, to be thinking about and praying about continuing to give in whatever way that you're able, uh, whatever way 
that you can because those those offerings do go to support the mission of the church, our local church, and of the wider church. Um, and so with that, I will ask Scott to pray over the offerings that we receive today. Lord, we just, this virus has changed the way that we meet. It changes the way that we worship. But Lord, it doesn't change our heart for you. Lord, you ask us to give and we give. And my request is that these gifts that are given to us, Lord, that we use them in ways that honor you and please you. So please bless all the givers and bless the way that this money is used. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, if you'll join me, this is a very call and response kind of worship service. So I'm going to include you again in our benediction today. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, risen is risen indeed. indeed. Go now to imagine. Go now to shape the world. Go now to be blessed that you may also be a blessing. Go now as a risen people. Alive in the spirit and way of Christ. And now we sing the song that we sing at the end of every worship service at Mitchellville Christian Church. Uh, and we are going to sing both verses today. So if you are with someone in your home, join hands with them. And if you are watching by yourself, go ahead and lift your hands in this way so that we can be in a spirit together even while we're apart. peace. Thank you all for being here. Happy Easter, everyone. <laughs>